The refusal of Israeli occupation Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to consider a ceasefire in Lebanon has sent shockwaves across the region. In response, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad has made it clear that his government will throw its full weight behind Lebanon in its battle against Israel. Assad's use of the term maximum support is not just rhetoric, but a firm commitment to provide Lebanon with all necessary aid, encompassing every facet of assistance, whether humanitarian, logistical, or military. This move signals Syria's deepening involvement in the conflict and its readiness to assist its long-time ally, the Lebanese resistance, in the face of Israel's aggression. For now, Syria's support has largely focused on humanitarian aid. The Syrian government has opened its borders to Lebanese refugees fleeing the relentless Israeli bombardment, with over 500 individuals reportedly crossing into Syria in recent days. Assad's newly formed government, under Prime Minister Mohammad Ghazi al-Jalali, has placed top priority on assisting these displaced populations. During a recent cabinet meeting, Assad urged his ministers to focus their energies on supporting Lebanon in all areas, emphasizing the need for Syria to stand by its Lebanese allies without hesitation or reservation. This humanitarian effort comes in the wake of devastating Israeli airstrikes that have killed hundreds in Lebanon, including over 50 children. According to the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, UNHCR, Long lines of vehicles have been spotted at the Syrian-Lebanese border, filled with desperate families seeking safety. The Syrian government's rapid mobilization of resources to aid these refugees showcases its determination to mitigate the human toll of this conflict, even as it braces for the possibility of broader military involvement. However, Syria's support for Lebanon may soon extend beyond humanitarian aid. Reports suggest that Assad's government has sanctioned the gathering of over 40,000 fighters from across the Arab world, ready to defend Lebanon in the event of a full-scale Israeli ground invasion. These fighters, many of whom are positioned near the Golan Heights, are awaiting orders from Lebanese resistance leader Hassan Nasrallah. While these combatants may not be elite troops, Israeli media has already expressed concern over their potential impact, noting that even smaller, less experienced forces have inflicted significant damage on Israeli communities in surprise attacks. The presence of these fighters represents a serious escalation in the conflict, with Israel increasingly targeting Syria as part of its broader campaign. Israeli warplanes have intensified their operations across Syrian airspace, targeting areas they suspect of harboring Lebanese resistance allies. Yet Syria's air defense systems have so far responded effectively, sending a clear message that Damascus will not tolerate unchecked Israeli incursions. The conflict is rapidly approaching a dangerous tipping point. Israel's airstrikes continue to claim civilian lives, most recently in Lebanon's Bakar Valley, where a strike on a building housing Syrian worker killed 23 people. The casualties included women and children, further inflaming tensions across the region. While Israel claims its attacks are targeting Hezbollah positions, the reality on the ground suggests that civilians are bearing the brunt of these bombings. Today, we convened to propose a global alliance for the implementation of the two-state solution. Of course, from our perspective, from the Kingdom's perspective, at least primarily, with a focus on establishing the Palestinian state. In the wake of our discussions, we will organize practical follow-up meetings at the senior working level in Riyadh, Brussels, Cairo, Oslo, Amman, and Ankara. These meetings will focus on the action points identified during today's ministerial meeting aimed at, advancing, at, aimed at advancing UN and other related peace efforts in the context of implementing the two-state solutions. I want to express a special gratitude to our co-conveners, our co-chairs, the European Union and Norway, with whom we have been working very closely over the past months on this initiative and on this program, and I am also grateful 
to all the countries that attended, well over 90 countries, almost 60 ministers, showing how much interest there is and how much focus there is on actually moving towards a permanent settlement of the Palestinian conflict, which can, of course, only happen through the establishment of a Palestinian state. Thank you, and with that, I, uh, I ask for your questions. Well, uh, I, I, no, I don't regret that at all. I absolutely, on the contrary, I think that this is a very important uh, part of building uh, the puzzle of a uh, better solution in which the moderate forces uh, represented here by Prime Minister Mustafa and the Palestinian Authority uh, can be strengthened physically through economic means but also politically by universal recognition which is the opposite of the extremist forces this is the the state of Palestine that uh, that was uh, that, that lies in the, uh, the vision of the Oslo Peace Accords. Uh, that is not the Hamas vision. It's what came out of PLO and Fatah and the broad uh, agreement to lay down arms and to build a Palestinian state. And I think it is incredibly important that uh, right now, at this very moment, that we, we continue to do that work. That is linked to the normalization that, uh, that uh, His Highness talked about. It's linked to what we do at the HALC. And we just had a meeting in the, uh, in the donor uh, uh, committee. And it's linked to the work to try to strengthen the, uh, the, the, the possibilities for the Palestine Authority to again take control over Gaza when the war is over. Thank you. سمو الامير نستطيع ان نقول بان هذا التحالف هو نتاج للجهد الذي قامت به اللجنه الوزاريه العربيه الاسلاميه قبل اكثر من سنه ونص تقريبا وهل نستطيع ان نعرف ملامح هذا التحالف سمو الامير هو لا شك جزء من جهود اللجنه الوزاريه لكنه ايضا جهد مشترك بيننا وبين الاصدقاء في الاتحاد الاوروبي وفي النرويج ويتجسد في اجتماع اليوم الذي حضره اكثر من 80 دوله 60 منهم على المستوى الوزاري وسيكون مسارات عمل كما ذكرت ومع انطلاق مسارات العمل سيكون هناك وضوح اكثر كيف نستطيع ان نساهم في قيام حل الدولتين فعليا واقعيا على الارض ليس نظريا وبالتاكيد من خلال قيام الدوله الفلسطينيه Carrie Norton for Le Monde. Hi, I have two questions for you and Mr. Borrell. Uh, your Excellency, yesterday your country, the EU, France, um, the US, uh, Qatar and the Emirates have requested a 21 days call for truce. Um, Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu has already just said on the plane and just outside of the plane that he was rejecting it. What are your reactions, both of you, please? Uh, I wish I could tell you I was surprised. Unfortunately, uh, we have seen since the eruption of the, uh, uh, the war in Gaza uh, a pattern uh, that uh, every time we are told that we are close to a ceasefire in Gaza, uh, uh, it doesn't happen. Uh, similarly, when we were with our partners working together on a very concrete call for a ceasefire in regards to Lebanon, uh, our impression was that that was acceptable, only to learn now that no, it is not acceptable. And I fail to understand uh, how uh, war and the continuation of war uh, can be uh, the only option. There must be other options, and therefore I will reiterate our call for ceasefire, and I will reiterate our uh, call for diplomacy to prevail, and I will note that uh, the statement was worded very carefully to ensure that not just uh, uh, Lebanon's interests were taken into account, but also the interests uh, of uh, Israel. And I hope, again, that we can allow diplomacy to prevail rather than the guns. I just want to reiterate that yesterday, the 27 member states of the European Union agreed on a statement on exactly the same line as the one that was forged by uh, US and France and joined by other states. The war is not a solution. And these attacks against Lebanon has been creating such a great number of civilian casualties that cannot just be justified by the right to defense. Certainly, the right to defense exists for everyone, also for Israel. 
But the, the way this war is being conducted, by the, this high number of strikes from the air, from the land, forcing hundreds of thousands of people to leave their countries, their houses, which are being destroyed, so they will not have anywhere to go back, is certainly not the way to ensure the security of Israel. I think it's just the contrary. So I can only reiterate the call of the member states of the European Union for a ceasefire and to look for the only possible solution, which is the implementation of the agreed United Nations resolutions. We can do one last question, please. The Baalbek strike in particular has drawn international outrage. Eli Cassis, the mayor of the nearby village of Yunin, confirmed that the bodies of 23 Syrian citizens were pulled from the rubble, with additional injuries reported among both Syrians and Lebanese. Hezbollah's paramedic services and the Lebanese Red Cross have been working around the clock to recover bodies and tend to the wounded. But the scale of destruction is overwhelming. Israel has remained tight-lipped about the incident, merely issuing a vague statement about targeting Hezbollah, a familiar pretext to cover up its attacks on civilians. Israel continued its offensive by targeting infrastructure along the Syria-Lebanon border, claiming that it was being used by the Lebanese resistance to smuggle weapons. The Israeli military stated that these weapons, allegedly transported from Syria into Lebanon, were being used against Israeli forces. Lebanese Transport Minister Ali Hamieh said that the strike specifically hit the Syrian side of a small bridge that serves as a crossing into Lebanon. Hamieh added that he was unsure whether the crossing remained operational following the attack. Again, Israel lied, as this is the only crossing that civilians fleeing the hostilities in Lebanon use. As the violence escalates, the international community has called for a 21-day ceasefire to allow for diplomatic efforts. But Netanyahu's refusal to consider such an option has dashed hopes for a swift resolution. The situation has now reached a critical juncture where both sides are preparing for the possibility of a prolonged and bloody conflict. Israel has made clear its intention to launch a ground invasion, while Syria and its Arab allies appear ready to respond in kind, setting the stage for a wider regional war. From a Syrian perspective, this moment represents an opportunity to strike back at Israel after years of Israeli support for rebel groups during Syria's civil war. Assad has long accused Israel of attempting to destabilize his government. And now, with the tables turned, Syria sees a chance to settle old scores. The presence of tens of thousands of Arab fighters in Syria prepared to enter the fray on behalf of Lebanon has only heightened Israeli fears of an invasion into occupied Palestine. Such a move could dramatically alter the balance of power in the region creating new vulnerabilities for Israel that have not been seen in decades. The situation in Lebanon is a direct reflection of the broader power dynamics at play in the Middle East, where regional alliances and rivalries shape every conflict. For Assad, supporting Lebanon is not just about aiding an ally. It is a strategic move aimed at reasserting Syria's influence in the region and pushing back against Israeli hegemony. Damascus has long viewed Israel as a destabilizing force in the region, and the current conflict provides Syria with a chance to challenge that dominance. The humanitarian dimension of this crisis cannot be overlooked. As more Lebanese civilians flee the violence, Syria will likely face increasing pressure to accommodate the displaced, further straining its resources. But Assad's government seems determined to rise to the challenge, seeing this as a necessary price to pay for standing with Lebanon against Israeli aggression. Syria's history of resistance to foreign intervention, coupled with its deep ties to Lebanon, ensures that it will remain a key player in this unfolding conflict. At the same time, the intensifying Israeli air campaign on Syrian territory highlights the broader geopolitical stakes. By striking Syria, Israel is attempting to weaken its neighbor's capacity to assist Lebanon, but these attacks could easily backfire. 
Syrian air defenses, bolstered in recent years, have proven capable of fending off many Israeli strikes, and Damascus is unlikely to back down in the face of such provocations. I thank the Secretary General for his briefing at the beginning of the session. I also thank Algeria, representing the Arab group in the Security Council, for their ongoing support. I thank all the members of this August Council for their ongoing support to the sovereignty of Lebanon, its unity and stability. I seize the opportunity to thank all the members of the Council for supporting the resolution extending the mandate of UNIFIL for another year upon the demand of Lebanon. Mr. President, in Lebanon we are facing a blatant violation of our sovereignty and of human rights through the brutal practices of the Israeli enemy against our state and against the Lebanese people. Israel is violating our sovereignty by sending their warplanes and drones to our skies, by killing our civilians, including youth, women and children, destroying homes and forcing families to flee harsh humanitarian conditions. Furthermore, they are spreading terror and fear among the Lebanese citizens in full view of the world which is watching idly. Regrettably, the number of innocent civilian martyrs and of the injured is increasing. Hundreds of civilians lost their life within a few days. Hospitals are overwhelmed, unable to accept more injured. Lebanon is today victim of an electronic cyber aggression and of an air and maritime aggression that can turn into a ground aggression and can become an all-out regional war. I hope to come back to my country armed with your explicit stance calling for the cessation of this aggression and for the respect of the sovereignty and safety of my country. We are witnessing today an unprecedented escalation, resorting to new tools, especially electronic tools, to harm my people. The aggressor is claiming that they are only targeting combatants and weapons, but I assure you that the hospitals of Lebanon are full of civilian injured people, including dozens of women and children. In light of the above, a question begs to be asked. Who can guarantee that such aggressions won't be waged against other states if no deterring measures and decisive sanctions are not taken against the aggressor? Who can guarantee us or any other states the safety of our food, water or any other commodities entering our territories? Mr. President, these events cannot be dissociated from a long history of conflicts and violations against Lebanon for centuries. The Israeli aggressions, the ongoing Israeli aggressions against the Lebanese territories constitute a blatant violation of our national sovereignty and of our rights as a member state of the United Nations. This situation is not new, however. Lebanon has known long periods of tensions and aggressions, which threatened its stability and the safety of its citizens. But Lebanon remained steadfast, and the Lebanese have bravely and still bravely face all these aggressions on all the Lebanese territories. Mr. President, I speak in the name of Lebanon, and I am here not only to file a complaint and not to submit a detailed report of the number of martyrs and injured and of the destruction against our country. All this is documented before the public opinion. I am here today hoping to come out of this session with a serious solution based on the joint efforts of all the members of the Security Council to put pressure on Israel to achieve an immediate ceasefire on